Today, we're going to interview Pawn Stars guest expert, Murray Sawchuk. In addition to appearing regularly on the hit TV show Pawn Stars as an expert on magic, he is also a stage illusionist, a magician, a comedian, actor, and host. He currently has a resident magic show at the Tropicana. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to subscribe to our channel for free. You can also like, comment, and follow us. We're going to have a lot of great celebrity interviews coming up, so make sure to click on that notification bell so you can be notified every time we upload a new episode. Also, we ask that you post a link to today's episode of our show on all your social media to help spread the word. Now, let's say hello to Murray Sawchuk from Pawn Stars. Hi, Murray. Welcome to the John Rex Show. How are you today, sir? I am wonderful. How are you doing, John? Uh, we're doing great. Thank you. So, yeah. uh, Murray, a lot of aspiring performers come to Vegas each year hoping to make it, but most of them end up working regular jobs. How did you manage to break through, get an agent, and start finding paying gigs? You know, it's interesting. It's a long but short story. You know, I'm from Vancouver, Canada originally. I moved to the States to Orlando in 1998. And, um, and then I was in Orlando, but I knew I needed to get to L.A., or New York, you know, L.A. more so for television, Vegas for live shows. So I started in the old days. I mean, this is, you know, 2000 when the Internet was just kind of a starting thing. I still mailed out hard press kits with a photo, a letter, all that kind of things. Now you can just send an email or text somebody. It's unbelievable. But back in the old days, so I would send out four to five hundred envelopes with a headshot. And a letter saying, I want to be on TV, or I'd like to be on your talk show. I remember letters to Arsenio Hall, Elizabeth Taylor, Oprah, you know, way, you know, shows that I obviously couldn't get on at that time, but I really shot for the stars. I figured it's already a no now, so why not, you know, send it to them and get a real no, you know, because all it takes is one yes. And in that that process as well, I was writing to the producers and directors. There's a book called The Hollywood Creative Directory that used to come out back in the 90s and 80s, it had everybody listed in there. You could find out the casting directors, the the president, and you had the emails and phone numbers, like the Bible of Hollywood. And now they don't have that anymore, but I'd get one every year, and I'd sit and write names, and I'd write these letters personally. Anyways, long story longer, a uh, producer from from L.A., John DeCourcy, liked me, along with a guy named Robert Whalen, to do a show here in Vegas. And uh, they said, we want to give you a shot at the Frontier Hotel. So I opened uh, the Frontier January 26, 2002. And I've been on the Las Vegas Strip now for 21 years. Wow. And, uh, and you asked me the secret of staying here, how to have a show here. I think, you know, it's all about overhead. I think it, it goes, that goes for any business or anything, whether you're renting a home, owning a business, starting something, it's all about overhead. You know, if... If you're making more than your overhead, well, that's usually a good business. If you're losing more than your overhead, then that's not a good thing, you know? So so for me, um, that's why I've always looked at things, not made my show too huge or too costly that I can't afford to do it in any circumstance. So so you mentioned reaching out to the Oprah show. I used to be a producer for Oprah. I'm curious, what, what year did you reach out? Oh, man, I have the letterhead somewhere in my collect you know my box of archives mm -hmm. and i believe i wrote i mean i'm thinking i probably wrote her i want to say like 1991 1990 you know did they ever respond to you yeah yeah i got a letter back and i, I think it was signed from her but obviously probably her secretary or somebody mm -hmm. thanks for your stuff we'll keep it on file you know things like that and i also sent a thing to elizabeth taylor because she was doing you know a lot of charities for aids foundation at the time and i said i'd love to be a part of that i'm a huge supporter of charities you know, if you ever need an entertainer so but i was only you know 14, 16 years old, you know, just trying to make it in the business. Um, but but it was, you know, that's just kind of the way I think, you know. So, uh, by the way, what uh, part of Canada were you from? Vancouver, the West Coast. Oh, okay. so, yeah. yeah. Now, the two-year lockdown put a lot of people in Vegas out of business for a while. Is Vegas back at full speed or is it still on the comeback? It's, you know, it's back at full speed. You know, there's certain things that you see that they're still hanging on from covid and the little things, I even see it across the states. So when I travel, you know, I'm used to going to a hotel. You pay two to five hundred bucks a night for a hotel room, and you get your towels changed every day. It gets clean nowadays. A lot of hotels, and some of the nicest ones are saying, "Hey, if you want new towels, you want your rooms changed every day, I just call down." But you, we don't have regular service. You know, I think they also realize that they save a lot of money on staff, also on cleaning supplies when you don't need 
a person to come and give you a new towel every day. You know, we live in our own homes. I use the same towel for four or five days. It doesn't bother me, you know, but I think so they've, I think COVID indirectly, a few places have kept that in place. They've probably saved a lot of money. When you have 5,000 hotel rooms like the MGM and you're doing that service, you cut that down by 10 or 20% over the year. That's a lot of money you're saving, you know? Now, I know that magician David Copperfield has a team of technicians developing and helping him build some of his illusions. And some of those illusions are very expensive to develop. Uh, but I also believe that a brilliantly conceived idea can attract a lot of attention without being terribly expensive. Uh, Penn and Teller are very witty and clever without spending a fortune uh, on their show. Um, what, are your ex what are the expectations of a modern day audience today when it comes to these sorts of things? You know, I think we're so prone now to our phones. You know, we still watch so much on these things now, small little videos and clips like that, that now a magician, you can do close up magic or sleight of hand. You don't need to make like what I did in America's Got Talent, the steam train disappear. It's pretty phenomenal when you can do that in front of somebody's eyes on a theater stage, you know, where there's really nowhere for a train to go. Um, but nowadays, I see a lot of shows in town using big LED walls, one camera, and they're doing close-up magic. Now, my opinion on that, though, is I came from the showbiz world of seeing Liberace perform. You see Elvis, you see Tom Jones, you see Victor Borga, you know, you see these big spectacle entertainers, even like now Beyonce, you know what I mean? Um, I don't want to see Beyonce in a jazz club. You know, I want to get the full spectacle. That's why you go to see Beyonce, you know? Um or Machine Gun Kelly, or whoever you want to see, you know. Same with Frank Sinatra. I want to see that 36-piece orchestra, you know, uh, when he was around. So when magic is a visual art form, I think it needs to be visual. So meaning if I'm going to spend 80 to 100 bucks for a ticket to go see a magician, I want to see that trick from the 20th row or the 50th row. I don't want to be looking at a screen seeing a card trick. So I can do that here online. You know, I can go on YouTube or on any other, you know, platform and watch the same thing. And I didn't spend a hundred bucks to watch a TV screen. I want to see somebody live perform. So I'm a bit more of the old fashioned style of play the room. Meaning if I'm sitting with 20 people in a small room, then I can do close up magic because it's designed like that. They're right here. But if I'm in a room of 1200 people or 2000, you know, play the room appropriately, do tricks that somebody can see in real time live with their own eyes, not needing a screen, you know, because that's what live entertainment's about. You know what I mean? Vaudeville, I never had screens. You had to be really visual and really entertaining. So yeah, Houdini never had screens. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> making things disappear is a big part of magic and always has been. What else do audiences really respond to like over the last few years? Is it guest appearances by celebrities appearing on stage with you? Is it some other technical form of, of magic? You know, what are you noticing out there in the marketplace? Um, I think people are really um, prone to, I think it's the social media influence, you know, mm. um, if they see something on TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, um, all the Twitch, all these mediums, I think that's the, really, the relationship now. You know, back in the old days, you'd see somebody on Oprah, a talk show, Ricky Lake, Jay Leno, all this stuff. And as you know, those talk shows, you know, the viewerships are very low. So you get half a million watching those talk shows now. That's that's a good night for a talk show. Whereas you can put up one video online now and get 8 million views if it's done right. You know, what, so I'm, what, I'm seeing a lot of people, you know, looking at that. And when they come to see a show, a lot of those people are the ones that do watch social media and they want to see some of that content, you know. You know, when I was in Chicago uh, working with Oprah, all the big talk shows were in Chicago. Phil Donahue, Ricky Lake. I mean, it went on and on. Uh, you know, Geraldo, everybody was in Chicago. So it was sort of the, yeah. the epicenter of the talk world. Yeah, even Jerry Springer, I think, too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you something off the air later about that. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> so when you're pursuing financial success as a magician, what is most important these days? Is it having a G-rated show that the entire family can attend? Or is it having an extraordinary spectacle that just, you know, that just spreads like wildfire on social media after people see you do it? I think it's a balance. I think it's important that you connect with the audience. You know what I mean? Um, my big thing is you need to become the star, not the props, not the um, items, not the stage setting. You need to become the star. So meaning, you know, you watch Joe Perry from Aerosmith, who I'm a huge fan of. His guitars are very famous. If you know his playing, his look is very famous, but his brand is what you're going to see. I mean, there's a lot of guys who play great guitar, but he is one of the best. But you're going to see everything. 
the long hair, the outfits he wears, the guitars he plays, the way he works the stage. There's a lot of great guitar players, though, that sit in a stool and don't do anything. You know what I mean? But when you're going to see Joe Perry, you're going to see why he plays like that. If you go to see Slash, you're going to see Slash play a guitar like that. And that's why they're who they are, because they're very good at what they do. They also have a great package. So I think as a magician or any entertainer, even a comedian, you need to sell who you are and and what you what your brand is not just that i could i bought this expensive trick i'm going to do it for you i become popular off it which is lovely but i think that's a very short term goal and i don't think it lasts very long so if you can sell yourself as a product then people will keep coming back back to you it goes for anything you know whether you're buying donny soap or you're buying tide liquid soap or you know you're buying a, a, the latest car you know the the tesla you're trying to buy the brand and what they stand up for i think you know and i go same for entertainment now you mentioned buying uh, an expensive an expensive trick is there a marketplace out there where uh magicians and illusionists purchase large illusions or is everybody building their stuff from scratch no, the many places online you can buy stuff. There's a very famous place online called magicauction.com. And you can buy brand new used illusions and things like that. Um, also, there's a Facebook marketplace for magic things like anything now. Uh, but there are some very well-known builders in town here, Vegas, and around the states and the world that are known for magic. You know, David Mendoza is a huge builder. And he builds for concerts as well now, like major, major touring shows, as well as magic. Um, but a lot of these guys are are the ones that that you go to and but you know the times have changed now like when you get a booking you know and a lot of people know this or don't know this say you get i don't know fifty thousand dollars for a booking for a show in a casino in the midwest well usually that fifty thousand you have to take your air flights out of uh your travel stuff your shipping and your show they'll give you rooms and they'll also give you a per diem when you're at the hotel to feed your cast and crew but to get them there and do the show is on you and that's out of your fifty thousand so if that's the case, if I'm going to bring 10 illusions with me, and what I mean by illusions is big boxes and big tricks that weigh four to 600 pounds, I need to put them on a truck or a plane, ship them there or drive them there, get them there, set them up, do the show, and then come back. Well, getting them to Omaha or Nebraska or Virginia, wherever I'm going and back, that alone could be $25,000. Just in those seven or eight big illusions might only be 20 minutes of my show. And I'm doing a 90 minute show. So lately and over the last 10, 15 years, because of gas prices, airline flights and all this stuff that costs a lot more money, a lot of magicians have learned to be a lot more creative, and a lot more entertaining. They're just buying these big props and that because they cost a fortune. You need to take that that cost out of your your gross to see what you make. You know, same as when Britney Spears goes on tour or whoever's touring right now with these big trucks and trailers. Look, look, perfect thing is Taylor Swift. I think she has like 90 trucks or something. Now she's making a fortune because she's selling out 70,000 seat arenas four nights in a row. 1.5 billion is billion with a B is the projected gross for her new tour. Can you believe Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? But now people don't realize if you were to really break that down, I mean, 90 trucks, I mean, her staff has got to be over 150 people, if not maybe 250 plus the the ground crew of the union. So when you, it's a lot of money, but when you look at the kind of tour she's doing, that money, you know, that 1.5, 1.8 billion is not going directly into her pocket, as you know. But if you want to create that kind of a machine, that's okay. Then you take 25% of that and that's your profits, you know. But, you know, with other acts that aren't like making that kind of money, as you know, there's very few, um, you've got to watch what you're taking, what you're bringing, because at the end of the day, it only comes out of your pocket. You know, I've always said that Taylor Swift or Britney Spears, that one person is responsible for all those salaries, all those mortgages, all those college funds, all those babies getting their milk and going to school from all those parents that are working for them. You know, it's amazing how one person's, you know, success is actually 150 to 200 people's success. You know, or even look at Bill Gates or Steve Jobs or any of these people that have created, you know, Jeff, Jeff Bezos, you know, how, how much he's in debt to helping all these people have jobs, you know. So it's interesting. People forget that, you know, that that one idea uh, can really help a lot of people. Or if it goes downhill, it goes downhill for everybody. You know, I have heard that David Copperfield has sold more than $4 billion in tickets over the years. If you had to guess, how much money do you think that Copperfield and Penn and & Teller will make this year? What would you guess? That's hard to say, man. You know, the times have changed so much with ticket sales. You know, now, don't forget in the 80s and 90s, as you know, when you sold a ticket for $100, you got $100, maybe a box office fee of five bucks or six that went to the hotel or somebody that sold them. But usually 
there wasn't Ticketmaster. You had to buy them at the hotel. You had to buy them at the theater. So there was no none of these other agencies taking a cut. So nowadays with Groupons and these discount tickets and Gold Star and all these other different places, when you sell a hundred dollar ticket and you have your add-ons, and by the time everyone takes their piece out of it, you know, that hundred dollar ticket, you may end up with like maybe forty five dollars. So it's not exactly what you're seeing. Like in the old days, in the eighties, when you sold a hundred dollar ticket. You got a hundred bucks. So, you know, realistically, I have no idea where Coffee will be because we're doing, you know, when we're doing so many ticket deals, people who want us from two months from now, they'll pay full price because they want to come to us. They're a fan. Then people who are here in Vegas for the day going, oh, wait a minute. I know that guy. They're on sale because as if we have some empty seats, most of the time, if you're a smart businessman, you put those seats on sale because as you know, once those that day is gone, those seats and those sales are gone forever. So you might as well try to get every dollar you can for those seats. So it varies. I mean, I'm sure Copperfield makes a, a good chunk of, of money a year, you know, probably, you know, five million or more a year. And I'm sure Penn and Teller do as well, well, you know, but there's also all those overheads, you know, David doesn't have as many overheads as now as he used to back in the old days when he toured, he had the buses and a lot more crew. His crew is pretty narrowed down to, it's very streamlined, you know, so it's very profitable. So if an investor came to you and said, we'll give you X number of dollars to create and produce your dream magic show, what sort of things would you like to do and what direction would you take it in? Um, I think two things. I would have the hotel or the venue behind me, which is important. You know, you got to have support. So it's one thing to have a great idea, um, but it's another thing to have the hotel, the theater, the venue support you or the city or the venue. So, you know, perfect example is say you go to a smaller town because in Vegas, supporting a show here is hard. There's 76 shows every night here. So the city supports entertainment, but it's not going to pick favorites. If you go to a small town, like say I just played um, Orlando, Florida last weekend in a small town called Oviedo, which is about, I don't know, 20 minutes outside of Orlando. Really nice community. But they supported the show. So we sold that show out because there wasn't a lot going on. They only have a couple of theaters there. My show is at the Cultural Center. And so it's a thing for the whole community to do. So they're very in on it. Now, if there was 30 shows in that one small city, they wouldn't be able to support as well because you don't want to pick favorites. So in Vegas, it's very hard. So going back, what my dream show would be, you know, I think two things to always have it full, have it supported, and also create a show that's a mix of the large scale stuff that you you can't see anymore. Or people buy these VR goggles, you know, the, that looks like virtual reality. Well, you don't need a VR goggles when you watch a magic show because it's right there in front of you. You are trying to create miracles in front of you. Um, but you definitely need the backing. You need the support. And you also need the ticket sales to create these large illusions. You know, that's that's the reason there's no more real old school Las Vegas showgirl show. You know, my wife, Danny, is a showgirl. And she closed down the last showgirl show in Las Vegas called Jubilee at Bally's. And that was, you know, back in the old days, they had a cast of 160 people, 60 stage crew behind them. The Titanic was on stage. I mean, the costumes and the opulence was unbelievable. You know, they had a stage that went down two stories and it went up two stories. Uh, but nowadays, you need to sell a lot of tickets to pay for all those people to make that show run. You know, well, I'm curious, what did they replace that show with? It's empty. The showroom is empty right now. There's nothing in there. I mean, they've had other shows try in there. They've lasted a year or two, you know, but it's such a gorgeous theater. But the union's not cheap to run because you need a lot of people to run that theater. And you need a show that's going to deliver. And uh, yeah, yeah, look, if Elton John said, I want to do a show there tonight, he'd sell it out because the theater only holds, I don't know how it is, about 700, to maybe 1,000, uh, maybe 1,200. But he could sell it out because he's Elton John. But would he make much money? No, because he could sell out an arena. So it becomes that point of who can go in there that can sell that many tickets. But most people who go in there can only sell maybe 100 or 200 tickets. So they lose a lot of money whereas the people that could sell out the show they're not making the potential so they're not going in there you know so tell us how the magic business is different today versus before the lockdown i think magic business uh now i think people are a little more cautious on what they're buying uh i think they also want to make sure that they do sell the shows out or that when they hire me or they hire other names in the business that they can deliver they do a good job and that that their customer relations don't get harmed by it you know so when they come see the show they're they're what the casino or the hotel or the theater really wants you know and it keeps their clientele you know um because i think throughout the pandemic we we learned a lot of what we need and what we don't need you know i think a big thing that we learned in 
uh, with the pandemic is we don't need a lot of these brick and mortar buildings anymore. You know, what you and I are doing right here, we could never do this, as you know. I'd have to fly to your studio, you know, stay in a hotel. You'd have to either fly me in or I'd fly myself and stay there and food per diem and do the interview. And then I'd hop in a plane and go back out. And yes, there's some places that still do that, Jimmy Fallon, Kimmel and all that. But nowadays we can do this and it's just as entertaining, you know, as sitting in a studio. So I think the brick and mortar building thing um, has gone downhill with people who own property and want to rent out office space. You don't need people to go into the office as long as they're doing their jobs. I mean, there's a lot of people that take it, take advantage of it and the job's not getting done. Well, then you get fired, you know, proof is in the pudding. So I think, think that's one thing we have learned uh, with the pandemic, you know. There are a lot of videos posted on social media where people explain how certain magic tricks are done. Does that help or hurt your industry? I don't think it helps it, you know, because um, because it's giving away secrets. But also, I think it does in the sense of it makes it advance more meaning. <clears throat> we're, we're not staying with the old tricks. You know what? No, we're not staying with the new and old things. We're having to recreate things to fool people, you know. And also, if if I've told you how I do something, if people are a fan of my work or like my personality or the product I put out there, I think um, they're still going to come because even if they know a trick works, they still want to see it in real time and to see if they really, it really is the way it works, you know? And, and once again, it goes back to building your brand of who you are and why they want to come see you. Now, I mean, people go to see Michael Boulé and they love Michael, you know, and him and I grew up back in Vancouver, Canada and Burnaby and he's singing standards of Frank Sinatra. Well, they've been played before. Why do they want to see Michael? Well, because of his personality and the way he presents himself, you know, and the music he's bringing. And he's bringing a little new twist to a lot of the old standards, you know. So it's all the way you package things. Tell me about IP theft, intellectual property mm -hmm. theft. In Los Angeles now, every producer I know, every A-list actor, everybody is constantly complaining about their projects being undermined or stolen or ripped off before they can even get them to market. Um, how uh, large of a phenomenon, or is that an issue in the magic space? Do you create illusions that are, you know, replicated uh, two years later by one of your competitors? Is that an issue, or is that not so much of an issue? If it, there's a trick that's really good, we see that happen often, you know. Usually not in the States, if you're a well-known magician, because you get shut down pretty quickly. And um, and that because we're we're all pretty connected here. We know somebody that knows somebody, you know, if you're in the biz long enough. But it happens a lot overseas. We'll come with an idea and all of a sudden go to Asia, China, and we'll see the person look almost looking like us doing the same darn trick, you know, or in Europe. It'll happen a lot, too, where they'll rip ideas off, you know, but it happens. You know, it's like any even in comedy, there's certain comedians that will steal certain jokes and try to get away with it, you know. But then if you're famous enough and you do it on TV, somebody's going to see it. And somebody's going to know, you know, that you stole it. So it's better just to work hard and, uh, and be original. Or if you want to use something, ask the act saying, hey, this joke would really go well on my show or this magic trick. Do you mind if I buy it off you or could I use it? You know, and sometimes it will be a yes, you know, and other times it won't be. You know, when you're younger trying out, though, everyone steals stuff or finds influence because that's how you kind of get used to doing comedy, magic or music. And then as you get along and you get more professional, the idea is to obviously branch out into your own world, you know, and, and what you are and, and create a brand for yourself. So what do you think attracts more people to your show? Is it your appearances on a national show like Pawn Stars or is it your successful social media marketing campaign? It's, it's definitely a balance. You know, I'll, I'll, on Pawn Stars, it's funny. Somebody walks up to me in there. I'd almost say the age of 45 or 50 to 80, you're pretty much it's going to be Pawn Stars because that's that's what they watch. If I see a young kid at 13 or 18 or 20 walk up to me, uh, more likely it's through my social media because that's their world, you know, and I can almost guess right away as they're walking up, you know, where they've seen me from or on YouTube uh, or any of those social media platforms, you know, um, but it's, it's funny. There's definitely different people that, that are fans of different platforms and that's where they recognize you from. And some people like kids who are 16 or 18 have no idea I've been on Pawn Stars for the last 17 years, you know, because they don't watch it. And likewise, people who are on Pawn Stars had never heard of me social media wise, you know, because that's not their realm, you know. And then you get that middle age where they've seen both and they, they know who you are, you know. So Vegas is attracting sports teams and new venues like the MSG Sphere. Do you think that uh, all of this new activity will significantly attract more tourists and larger audiences to Vegas and to shows like yours at the Tropicana? Yeah, 100%. I don't know if they're going to attract more shows 
because shows are specific. If you like comedy, magic, or whatever, um, yeah. But I think it's going to help a little bit. Also, don't forget, though, it hinders things. Because if you come to see a Raiders game, there's 70,000 people in the arena. And they come to Vegas for the football game. That's why they're here. Well, that means there's 70,000 hotel rooms being taken up. Not that everyone has their own room, but you get the idea. So now those rooms are taken up for people that may want to come to Vegas that weekend to see a show or to get out and walk around and do some shopping or see some tourist things because there's no rooms available for them to come see shows because it's taken over by the sports fanatics that want to see the sports, which is understandable. You know what I mean? Now, some sports fanatics love shows, so they'll stay a couple days and then they'll see the, see the, the game they came here for. And since they're here, they'll come see a show. So that way it does benefit. But it is definitely a balance. So when when there's an event in town that takes up everything, like F F1, when that comes, Formula One's coming in November, every hotel room will be full for the race. So realistically, having a show shows that week in Vegas probably aren't going to do that well because of the fact that people who are coming here are going to take up all the hotel rooms. And the reason they're coming for it is for Formula One. So anything race related, the bars will probably do well and the different clubs, you know, and they'll have a lot of things going on. But shows may not do that well because everyone's here for another reason but the shows. You know what I'm saying? So that's kind of how it works. What's a tougher audience, kids or adults? Um, I would say probably kids because they're very honest. So you do a trick and they think it's up your sleeve or it's behind your ear. They'll just say it. Whereas adults will sit there and <clears throat> think it's amazing, walk away and go, I think he had it here, I think he had it there. Whereas kids will just say what they think, you know, and the honesty you can't be because it's so pure, you know, uh, but they're probably the hardest audience just because they'll think and say what they, they want to, you know, so. When I was a kid in Michigan, uh, we had a uh, a local clown on TV and he did this appearance at the local, <laughs> at this local <laughs> hall. So we all ran down there and we watched and Milky is going through his, his routine, <laughs> and he puts this this magic trick next to him. And while he's talking, the magic trick flops over, and you could see how the trick was done from behind. And all the kids started giving him the finger and yelling, oh, no. yelling at him. So, so the illusion was just vaporized by that mistake. That's funny. That could be a funny bit, though. You know, if the guy was a comedy kind of guy, that could actually be something he could script into a show every time, you know, because it got a good reaction. He just needs to figure out a way to do that. So do you think the future of magic will involve having more technology and artificial intelligence embedded into the performances? I don't think so. I mean, we do use a lot of technology and magic now for certain things. I don't think it's going to be that more involved. The only reason I say that is because magic is a visual art form. Like what I do is I take a coin, put it in my hand and it disappears. So if I have any, if I have any technology attached to that, it takes away from what I'm doing, you know what I mean? So it's kind of like, if I want to see a violinist, you know, or a cello player or so I need, I want to see them. I don't need a lot of electronics with that because if you really want to enjoy that instrument, you want to see the pure side of it. You know, like even Garth Brooks is here in town doing Caesar's Palace with him in a hoodie. And I think it's called Garth Brooks plus one. So he brings his wife, Trisha Yearwood or another guest. They sit in a stool and they play his classics, but it's just him and a guitar. <clears throat> and it's great because you know, it's going back to the roots of why you liked him or his music and it's being really on, on an art level, really pure. Whereas I think that's what live entertainment's about. Now you go to see a DJ. Well, yeah, it's going to be electronic because that's what DJs do. And that's their, that's their vibe and their genre. But when you see other things like this, yeah, we see Garth Brooks in these huge arenas flying in from stuff, pyro and big screens. And that's pretty exciting because you're using technology for that. But when you're in, in a medium of being a performer or an artist, you kind of want to go back to that pure form of why people like you. You know, it's like watching a stand-up and having all these electronics work with a stand-up comedian or changing their voice or it wouldn't play as well because the reason stand-up works is because you're raw and pure, you know, and you're who you are. So, Do you know what the size of the venue Garth is playing in is? is it yeah, it's about 40, 4,000, 4,500 at Caesars Palace. 4,400? Yeah, about 4,400, yeah. No more than 5,000, yeah. How many times a week does he uh, does he appear? I think he does the weekend, so I'm not sure of his schedule. But probably, he probably does a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, maybe Sunday, you know. And, and it's just uh, him and his wife sitting on stage. Yeah, yeah, and he's got a, I think he has a small backing band, like five people, but nothing like his touring show. You know, his touring show is pretty spectacular. Hmm. Yeah. So do you think performing in Vegas five years from now is going to be dramatically different? Will the acts be bigger, more expensive? You know, what are your thoughts? No, I think they're going to go uh, and be a bit smaller, to be honest with you. Unless you're a name that can drive like a Taylor Swift, where you come in for two days, 
you clean house, you kill it and get the hell out. You know what I mean? Or Beyonce's coming here. She'll do the same thing, you know, but there's very, very few acts that can do that. I think acts that have residencies in town like mine and everyone else from Carrot Top to George Wallace, to all these great guys, uh, Tape Face. Um, I, you know, there's a couple of productions in town right now. Awakening It's a brand new production at the Wynn that just opened about six months ago. And I got a lot of dear friends in that. They're so talented. The whole cast is very talented, but it's a big cast. It's a big theater. And they're barely selling 200, 300 tickets a night. And the whole the theater holds 2,500 people. You know, Weeknight, or Weeknights or weekends? All week. They have one night off a week, you know. So it's a regular residency show. You know, the way to make money in town is you do four to six, four to six days a week. You know, and that's a resident show. And and they're really having a hard time trying to sell tickets and figure out why people aren't coming to the show. You know, it's been down for about six weeks. And, you know, and the problem with that showroom, too, is it's in the round. So what's happening is... There's 2,500 seats in the round, so people are allowed to take pictures before the show. But you always take pictures of the stage or whatever. Unfortunately, when you're taking a photograph, you're taking also a photograph of the seats across the stage because it's it's in the round, the stage. So every picture that's taken of that performance space before or after is showing 80% of the seats empty. It's the worst thing ever for a photograph for a performer, whereas in a regular theater, even if you're only three rows from the front and everything behind you not sold... You might get two heads in front of you. And nobody knows whether it's sold out or not. It looks great. But in this this venue, it's not helping them any. And and, it's, and they're trying to go back to that big production show thing, which is super expensive. I think they've spent over $190 million on the show already. You know, and every day that show doesn't make money, as you know, it keeps costing you. So you keep digging a hole, you know. So I think they're in a bit of trouble. The show is really cool. And the, the answers are wonderful. But they, I think they've, they haven't found their hook yet, you know, on why you need to go see that show. You know, Siegfried and Roy were very successful in town because you need to see them because they had tigers on stage. That was their hook. You could, these gorgeous tigers, you'd never see anywhere else in the world. They were right in front of you, you know, on top of the magic. You know, same with Cirque, so, yeah. You know, I, I've never been a fan of theater in the realm because no matter what, half the audience is is behind you. And I think that yeah. at some level that annoys people, Yeah. you know. But uh, have you ever thought about doing a Netflix special about you and your act? I've thought about it. I've never, I, I would totally do that, you know, in documentaries. I got a lot of funny stories, you know. I'm, I had my first comedy special come out about, I'd say about three months ago on Tubi, the Tubi app, T-U-B-I. And we're shooting my second comedy special this summer here in Vegas at South Point Hotel, August 21st. And so we're doing those and that that may go on Tubi or it may go to a Netflix. We're not sure yet, um, but because I own it and I sell, I produce myself. So then we, we send it to a distributor and they find the buyer for it. So um, but I would let I would definitely be on on the verge, and I'd love to do that. You know, I've, I've watched a few documentaries. They do a nice job. You know, I just watched Jelly Rose documentary, and I think I just watched a, a documentary on Flaming Hot Cheetos, the guy that invented that um, that uh, brand, which is a really great story as well. So I love I love documentaries. Did uh, does your contract with Pawn Stars or the Tropicana limit or restrict what kind of media you can do, what kind of shows you can do, what kind of documentaries you can do? No, nothing. It doesn't. Um, they're all exclusive to them and what they're doing. And then and that's about it. I would, I'd never go on another Polly Pond show um, as an expert because I'm so tied in with Pond Stars here, you know, and I love Rick and, and all the guys are very dear friends of mine, like family. So I'd never do that just on a personal level mm -hmm. as well as professional, you know. Um, but yeah, I've talked history with a lot of different, you know, National Geographic shows and that about Houdini and that, you know, um, but to go on something. Uh, similar, I wouldn't do it just out of my own work ethic. You know, I don't think they could do a lot to stop me, uh, but it's something I wouldn't wouldn't entertain. You know. Well, it's been great having you on the John Ark Show. Before we wrap things up, is there anything that either you or your wife would like to promote? Um, yeah, if you ever want to see us in Vegas, you know, my show is at the Tropicana weekly i'm also in the show fantasy at the luxor which is a one of the top uh female burlesque shows here in vegas um and then also my wife is the lead dancer for zz top and then and she also is the host of a touch of burlesque here in las vegas so she's always busy doing a bunch of stuff she's actually shooting a pilot right now in san diego so and you ever want to see me online of course my socials you know on youtube is magic murray and you just put murray the magician on google and you'll probably see more than you really want to see <laughs> is zz top uh doing a residency in vegas or are they just touring yeah, they do. They tour. They're on tour now. But when they're here in the residency, they do like two to three week series at the Venetian, mm -hmm. and uh, that's when uh, my wife Danny pops in and works with them. And uh, she's become very good friends with Billy and Elwood and and Billy's wife Gilly and all that. So they're really, really family, family kind of a family band. You know what I mean? They've been around for a long time. Well, Murray. By the way, those beers they never go out of style. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Isn't that true? I know, right? 
<laughs> so, uh, Marie, I want to thank you for coming on the John Ark Show. I want to wish you all the best to you and your family, and you're always welcome back on the show, my friend. Thank you, John. I appreciate it, and have a great week and an awesome summer, and uh, you're always a guest at any of my shows, my friend. Thank you once again for watching. I want to encourage you to subscribe to our channel for free. You can also like, comment, and follow us. We're going to have a lot of great celebrity interviews coming up, so make sure to click on that notification bell so you can be notified every time we upload a new episode. Also, we ask that you post a link to today's show on all your social media to help get the word out. Thank you, and we shall talk to you soon. Bye-bye.